So now you have in the place where in the Hindu temple you had a god image, you now have a human being who has these special qualities. And out of that human being, there is a, an upright form arising, which is completely hidden. All of this is hidden. And you only have the indication of this by this up at the top. Okay. And now, human beings in general no longer are kept out, but now human beings can come up and they can walk around the base, can process around the base. So you have an entrance which is open to anyone. You can go in and you can go around here. Anyone can do that. Yeah. So inside, was that a statue of a human being? No. Is the ashes, ashes, ashes or the remains? Oh, ashes. Ashes or remains. Yeah, generally ashes or remains of a saint in our, in our language. We would say that. <clears throat> or it could be like a relic of, um, many of them have relics of, that are attributed to the Buddha or his disciples. So it's very interesting if we, if we kind of think about the shift from this Hindu view to then this Buddhist view, and what a huge, what a huge transition that is, in this sense that that I can allow to awaken into myself this essence of something which is divine. Yeah. Got to put it in, in really simplifying, yeah. And this is happening concurrently that in in the New Kingdom, going over into Greece, is happening in the in the, in the West. Okay, so if we go on, this is just another view. So this is stone. This, this is stone. Uh, well, no, I, I, some uh, many of them are um, are brick, and then they were plastered white. <coughs> so now we're we're taking a bit of a leap. So we're. We're not looking at uh, the Minoan culture, which is actually very critical, but it's too much to go there. So, so basically what we've done is we've followed a path. So we've gone India, Mesopotamia, Egypt, yeah. <coughs> then there's the Minoan culture, and now we're in Greece. We start a different path. Yeah, just geographically. That's what I'm drawing map-wise. Okay? So now we have in Greece almost like the Egyptian temple turning itself inside out. Yeah. So what was enclosed in Egypt and this experience of having uh, having awakened in my constitution this sense of myself in the column and the columnal form. Uh, happening in a very controlled situation. Now, in a very short period of time, this inverts itself in the Greek temple, and you have the Greek temples set on promontories where no matter where you look, if this is, this is a Solignan coming into the harbor or in, in the towns up on the Acropolis, this image of the, the upright human being in architectural form was there no matter where you, where, wherever you work in your daily life. Mm -hmm. So we just now go to the next. So this is another picture now. How, how it looks at the sea. So it's like really on this promontory. So if you're anywhere near, it's there. Yeah. It's there. Oh, that's, that's this presence. OK. One. <coughs> the Parthenon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another picture. So we just now go to the plan, because this is now important to understand. So this then is the floor plan of a typical Greek temple. So what now happens is, as I was saying, you have the Egyptian temple turned inside out. <clears throat> and you have the columns around the outside. And then you have the cella or the dwelling place 
of the God. So the God to whom the temple is dedicated lives there, is present, is on the earth. And human beings can have, are continuously in activity with this God. So the way, it, the, the, the way Greek temples were used were that you would have processions that would come, say from Athens, you would come up onto the Acropolis, and the image of Pallas Athena was brought out. And the, the celebrations, the, um, the, um, the events in relationship to Pallas Athena took place in the open, out in front. Where anywhere, no matter what you were doing, you could look up and you could see that this is going on. So we just kind of think this through then. We have this structure of the Greek temple. It's three parts. <laughs> which lifts itself up off of the ground. So you have this sense of coming into balance with the earth, having this rhythmic uh, relationship with the horizon, and having this ability now to have a relationship with light. So I have, I have a head structure, I have a rib or rhythmic structure, I have a limb structure. <laughs> and I can now wake up in that body. And I can go through a process of education that can cultivate now these new light forces that I have in my own constitution. So I can study uh, mathematics, I can study geometry, I can study philosophy, I can study all of the Greek the arts. The arts that are all there in order to train this new capacity that everybody has. And um, this is a remarkable point. It's like a, a very short period of time where suddenly this sense of the self arrives and has this wonderful sense of kind of open balance. And then begins to find a deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger relationship with the earth and becomes then what we have in the world. Becomes what? Becomes what then arises in Rome. Rome. Roman civilization. Oh, really? <laughs> All right, so we have Greece <clears throat> and then we come to Rome. So this transition from Greece to Rome is an extremely critical point in this journey of this sun presence down into the human individuality, into the human person. And we have then coming into the world the kind of archetypal example of what this would look like right at this time, where we have the human being, the body, and Jesus. And then we have this sun principle, this Christos principle, becoming one with this Jesus. So we have Jesus Christos, or Jesus Christ, this, this uh, archetypal um, act of this perfect, balance of how these two find their way into relationship with each other. It comes right at this point. And then humanity goes on, and we go to then Rome, 
and this is uh, the temple of um, the mythological ancestress of uh, Caesar Augustus. You can look at it from the side. So, a couple of things we can observe in this. First of all, the temples, no, they, they're not on the promontory. They come down and they're part of everyday life. They're part of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you'll notice that the walls are pushed out. Yeah. <coughs> and almost all of these temples now become flakes. They basically become storehouses. <laughs> they become storehouses for um, the, the booty or the kind of um, what's taken from areas that are conquered. So, the, what would you call that? Um, tribute? Tribute, tri okay, tribute from areas that are conquered. And the tribute is brought and it's stored in the temple dedicated to the God who's connected now to the Caesar. So now, if we, if we can just contrast that with, we go back to India, where this sense of the divine is this, this complete wholeness which encompasses everything. Now, for the Roman, um, the picture of the divine is actually in the person, the human being, who is identified as a ruler, yeah. and who has who who arises from a creative genealogy that goes back to you know a a, 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 a god or goddess, and that view then becomes the state religion back to a god. And with each new Caesar, that was that process changed. <clears throat> and with each new Caesar, you had a new state religion that everyone had to adhere to. <laughs> so we can begin to get this kind of, this sense, if we kind of live with that, that the, there's something that's, that's, that's beginning to almost die out in this, this light element. Somehow it's becoming constricted, it's becoming um, imprisoned, being held. And when we look at architectural form, it's the Romans that then brought this skill, surveying, which made it possible to create pure rectilinear structure. Okay? And not only did they do it in their structures, but they did it over the landscape. So they laid out these absolutely perfectly straight roads. They ran all over, ran through, you know, over valleys and through through hills. They were carved. So it's the first time you had this sense of the person, the individual personality, with uh, with an inner thought, intellect capacity, who could, in a certain sense, take possession of substance. And we can begin to feel how there's something that, uh, this, this wonderful kind of awakening that happened with Greece begins to die. And of course, those formative processes that Steiner refers to, we still, we still imagine space in a Roman way. We still experience space. We still organize space in a Roman way. So what does that mean? And what, what have we kind of come to? 